most forms of fundamentalism, and clearly Shiite fundamentalism, in which the young men of Hamas brutalize their own desire and brutalize the feminine, right? And sexual abuse, right? And honor killing and rape is of course the shadow expression of the dissociated field of desire. We write about a new phenomenology of Eros, a new story of desire. Can we write about unique self and evolutionary unique self? Right, we're actually telling a new vision of the universal love story that's never been articulated before because at this time between worlds and at this time between stories, right, the crisis needs to be responded to with a crossing, which is a crossing to right, a new right, and momentous leap forward in the evolution of love, in which I become home more and more, I feel the goodness of my desire. And it includes everyone and no one's excluded. This is an unbearably important week. And I wanna, I wanna notice how the extraordinary becomes ordinary. We're in the fourth week. And we did four weeks of intensive conversation around the Ukraine. And by the fourth week, the tension begins to wander and People move back to their lives. We're not quite sure, appropriately, understandably, not because we're villains, but people don't know how do you sustain attention? How do you find your way? How do you find your way through? And What we need to do is, is to actually locate who we are. Who, who are we in this moment? And what does this moment demand from us? And today is going to be a day of, of joy. Now, it's a day of joy racked with outrageous pain. We laugh out of one side of our mouth, just as people laughed in hell. And there's a book that I cite often called Laughter in Hell, but the jokes told and the, the celebrations in the hardest moments in human history, particularly this book is about the concentration camps. So we're gonna laugh, although we're not in concentration camps, we're privileged, filled with privilege, filled with possibility, virtually everyone who's on this call, filled with potency, filled with the power of discernment and the capacities of homo amor. And yet our hearts are ripped apart. We're not sure what to make and where to go. We're disconnected from our bodies, from our sensuality, because we don't know how to do sense making. We can't find our way. And we need to be able to, as homo amor, and homo amor is the new human and the new humanity. And I want to talk today about what homo amor is with your permission. I want to talk about what homo amor is and what, what it means to respond to this moment in time. Last night, I shared with some people, my dear friends on the, the pre-meeting that we did right before I spent from like maybe 2 to 3 a.m. last night reading about the Ukraine, because Russia is using what's happening in, in the Middle East, and Russia's complicit and deeply involved. H Hamas leadership was in Moscow a couple of days ago, and the axis of the Chinese Communist Party and Putin's Russia and Iran and Hamas is a very, very strong axis. In other words, Iran's Hamas and the Houthis, H-O-U-T-I-S, right, in Yemen and Hezbollah and, you know, versions of Al-Qaeda, right, ISIS, the Islamic resistance, the Taliban, right, that axis of Iran is deeply aligned and controlled fundamentally by some very complex mixture, right, of Putin's Russia and 
the Chinese Communist Party and the the deep incapacity of serious swaths of leadership to make distinctions, fundamental moral distinctions, which emerges out of a kind of wokeism, right? A kind of incapacity to actually see atrocity for what it is, which has nothing to do with, has nothing to do at all with, you know, our hearts being ripped open for innocent victims, which just rips your heart apart, but that's not what wokeism is. And this has been talked about extensively and we talked about it in the weeks before. So I'm not going to talk about it now, but that that critical race theory, which underlies it, right? Wokeism, right? Senses which base their reading of history on an utter distortion of the basic structures of value are actually, and this is not a conspiracy theory, right? And this is because as you know, my friends, I don't truck in conspiracy theories. I have a kind of revulsion for their, their dispersal in ways that are kind of wrong and inappropriate. And I wrote and spoke about conspiracy theory extensively early in, into 2020. So conspiracy theories are, are are not our truck, right? Whatever we say has got to be rooted in kind of deep research and deep fact, right? And deep empirical evidence. So what I'm about to say is based on kind of deep fact and deep empirical evidence, which is that wokeism itself, that structure of thinking is not an accident. It's been like the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative economically, right? It's been deeply embedded in the Western world with great intention by the Chinese Communist Party in partial alliance with the KGB over the last 40 years. So there's an intentional psyop, psychological operation to literally split Western culture asunder and to divide it right, against itself, to create a kind of civil war, an intense polarization which rips apart the kind of fundamental moral compass and sense of direction, right? Of Western culture and what was once proud Western value. Now, there's not a word, not one word, not one word of conspiracy theory in that. That is heavily documented, right? Deeply, right? Deeply, deeply, deeply validated, right? By myriad sources of trustable empirical information. And so if you feel confused, or if you feel ripped apart, if you feel almost the subject of a psyop, if you feel you can't find your way, if you feel this fundamental tear, right, at the heart of your, your attempt in your body to do sense-making, at the heart of your sensuality, the depression of your, your very aliveness, Right, the sense of apathy, right? I feel completely apathetic, like nothing matters. It's all just totally everyone against everyone. The sense of utter nihilism. That sense of nihilism comes from multiple vectors, but it is intentionally amplified by intentional psyops that are intentionally orchestrated in multiple ways, whether it's 40 years of academic grants throughout the Western university system, which has bought and endowed so many chairs and so many boards, right? Or, right, whether it is actual deployment of techno-feudalist apparatus, the technologies of the web, right? To actually create division and to kind of rip the very heart of Western society apart. So that's a context, that's a hard context that needs to be said. Right. I will I actually didn't intend to talk about that this week. So 
you know, next week I'm not going to talk about it, but I will provide at the beginning of next week and one mountain a couple of sources if you want to kind of look at kind of propaganda, how propaganda works, the history of propaganda. The co-president of the Center for Inner Wisdom, my student friend, partner, interlocutor, um, Zach, Zach Stein, has done some some deep work with, with colleagues in a, a kind of sister initiative, right, on this topic. Right, so this is heavily, again, heavily documented, heavily validated. And I'm actually surrounded on um, literally at this moment, I could pull out six books, right, surrounding me that that deal with this deeply. So so first just to understand that. That's backdrop. That's not our that's not what we're going to talk about. That's just context. So I'm just saying if you feel confused, it's not because you're confused, is because there's an intentionally broken information ecology, which is virtually impossible to navigate. And what does Homo Amor do in a broken information ecology? Okay, so that's number one. Number two, I am going to talk about today what the fundamental movement is. And with God is his grace, with God is his self, I'm going to try and talk about as if I know what I'm going to talk about, but right, but I'm going to try. Because my heart's ripped apart, right? It's been been an excruciating several weeks since October 7th. Today, I think, is what, the 29th? So I don't know how many days that is, but it's about three weeks, three weeks plus a day. It's been an excruciating set of weeks. It's been a time of little sleep. The the ground invasion in Gaza, right, is is picking up steam. The The tragedy of innocence killed and the distortion of innocence killed is happening at the same time. You know, Israel's most significant left-wing anti-Netanyahu, anti-government organization, which is the most significant kind of pro-Palestinian voice in Israel, which is an important voice, right? And I personally am, right, deeply in favor of the establishment of a two-state solution. I don't think there can be one state. There has to be a two-state solution. And that's a much bigger conversation. But none of this has to do with that. But this this organization, right? It's called B'Tselem, and B E apostrophe. I think T S E L E M B'Tselem, right? Says that there have been two thousand plus some, right? And plus some is a abhorrent word. The killing of one person, of one innocent person, is tragic. But there's been two thousand plus some. I don't know the exact amount deaths of innocents in Gaza. That's of course very different. And that which is reported by BBC or the New York Times or Reuters, which as a standard policy, report the deaths that Hamas gives them. I right? just want you to understand that. So Hamas, which is has established beyond any shadow of a doubt that truth matters not one iota, that they are literally their headquarters is in the middle of a hospital with intention, right? Their guns are in the backs of their own women and children. They've stated openly and clearly that their intention is right to to accomplish right the goals of a culture of death, right, which is ultimately a worldwide caliphate in which any non-Muslim of a particular variety is annihilated. So they're the people right, giving the information about deaths, and that's reported without reserve, right, in the in the in the in the media. So let's just, I mean, it's a broken, and why would anyone know to find the right sources, right? People think I can trust my legacy reading. I can trust the New York Times. I can trust writers. I can trust the Guardian. I can trust the BBC. Well, well you can't. You have to find trusted sources. So I'm not going to talk. This is not the subject of today, but I want to just because, just to put that in the space, and I'm going to put just in the chat box, I'm going to ask Chris to put just three articles, okay? Just three articles, right? And a couple of people are texting me and saying, pull my shirt down. I guess they don't like my my gray shirt. I like my gray, my gray thing here, okay? So I'm gonna put um, three, I'm gonna put three articles in the chat box and we have to laugh in the middle of everything. I'm gonna put three articles in the chat box, okay? So, and, and they're all, they're worth reading in a very particular order. And then I want to I want to start today, okay? Because we have such a wildly important and wildly 
actually exciting and and almost exhilarating and and painful but but beautiful conversation to have today and, and the conversation today is what does it mean to create a world religion of love but i want to get very specific about it and very real not general not in just broad kind of new age terms but a very specific from a policy perspective what does it mean to to understand what's happening in the world today from the perspective of the universal love story and to actually understand what's happening in the world today as failed love stories and what are, what what kind of failed love stories exist and how does actually understanding what's happening today as failed love stories challenge us and change our perspective and change our policy and of course you know no place in the in in legacy institutions of the media do we see any discussion of what's happening today as a failed love story it's impossible literally impossible empirically to understand what's going on unless we understand it in the context of a failed love story which is part of what we've called the global intimacy disorder and only an evolution of intimacy based on a shared ground of value will allow us to respond for real to what's happening today and to alleviate suffering and to create the one breath and the one heart and the one love and the one eros Right, that we all know is right. All of us here, gathered here, know is the is the true nature of reality. So we're going to talk about what that means. That's our big conversation today, and it's a I want to have a, a kind of new or next step conversation, building of what we've talked about before, but really talk about it, think about it in a whole new way. But but before we do that, if I can just in the chat box, because we have we have like such a such an important day, and I'm I'm almost trembling, right, to even you know discuss this. So let's take a look here. Okay. So, so the first one I want to put, right, is an article by Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross is a, a middle of the road kind of mainstream, you know, policy person who's 35 years of deep experience, right, in the Middle East. He wrote an op-ed in yesterday's New York Times. It was actually, I don't agree with all of it, but it was excellent. And it's critical to read. So this is kind of required reading. So everyone to kind of say, you got to do and find the right sources, trusted sources. Dennis Ross is a trusted source. Let's put in that article number one. And he talks about the utter tragedy of a ground war and why he feels like it's an absolute moral necessity and how the leaders from every Arab country and Arab group have called him and said that that must happen. Meaning they're saying one thing publicly and another thing privately. Dennis is a well-respected figure, knows everyone in the region well for several decades. And he talks about those conversations and it's, it's an incredibly important article. Second article, if you wanna read just one article, and this is from the Atlantic Magazine, which is a, a fundamentally liberal left, right? Paper, okay, liberal left paper, number one, right? Number two, um, liberal left paper, right? The Atlantic, right, an article on decolonization right? The kind of the rhetoric of decolonization. It's critical. And I want to put that in. Okay. So you can put that in. That's number two, right? I'm asking everyone, don't read it now. This is for later. And three, an article by Michael Oren, right? Michael Oren was the in charge of trying to improve life in Gaza, right? Um, in 2017 in the Israeli government. And he, he's citing here at Lucy Davidowitz's, you know, work, right? The historian called the war against the Jews. Right, Th those all three are worth reading. Number four, I would encourage everyone to sign up. It's free to sign up for Barry Weiss. Just put the name in. Barry Weiss, right, has a she's a former New York Times reporter, an excellent reporter who left the New York Times with a group of other people to essentially protest the New York Times distorting facts. And, and not being a, an accurate and reliable reporter. He has something called the free press, right? And it's a, it's you don't have to agree with everything it, it says. Barry's all about objective reporting. That's what she's about, right? She's not left, right? She's a, a kind of serious objective reporter. And she's trying to kind of provide something that the legacy institutions don't provide. So I would just want to offer these into the space. I don't want to spend one mountain kind of debating their points, reviewing their points. But in other words, before, we have a conversation or before, you know, and I'm going to ask everyone and I madly appreciate everyone's texts. So, so I, I've gotten, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of texts with kind of questions, comments, and all the texts were from the most beautiful people ever. 
And the text also contained, you know, an enormous amount of just rank ignorance, right? Just like not literally understanding anything, right? Of the history and the structure, right? And so if you want to just begin to understand, right? What's going on. And all of these, all of these sources are fundamentally, you know, um, middle of the road to left-wing sources, okay? Middle of the road to left-wing sources. And so I just want to just invite everyone to read them. Our intention, our direct desire, right? In this period of time, in this time that we're about to be in, is to actually in some significant way participate in the evolution of love. For real. Okay, so we'll start here. We start now. Okay, it's 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 138. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna do about about 40 minutes, something like that. A little little shorter, a little longer, right? And we're gonna go kind of all the way in. David, give us the code. David's gonna give us a code. Do we have a drum roll? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Are we ready in the midst, right, of outrageous pain? And we've said for many years we live in a world of outrageous pain, and we live in a world of outrageous beauty. And the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. And the only response to outrageous beauty is outrageous love. And there are certain there are certain things that need to be done by the people who are on the ground at this moment. And, and those things need to be done. And they're they're tragic. And some of them, right, are about the heroic doctors operating in under impossible conditions in Gaza at this moment. And others is about other other people that are doing what needs to be done. Our 18-year-old Israelis, right, who are trying to ensure that there will be a state of Israel. Because with a network of tunnels that come out near Israeli beaches, we know that if Hamas, this is what Dennis Ross writes, is not dismantled. If Hamas continues, as every leader of every Arab country called and said to Dennis Ross, right, the entire region will, will actually self-implode in unimaginable suffering, which will then conflagrate all of the world. And so there's a set of impossible choices. And so there's people on the ground who are doing impossible things in an impossible system, in an impossible moment. What do we need to do? And by we, I don't mean the rest of the world, right? At this moment, I'm talking about what do we here in one mountain, many paths, what do we need to do, right? Who are we? What are we here? We who have, you know, and we started with my, my beloved homemate, Barbara Marks Hubbard, as we started One Mountain Many Paths as a seat of, of the revolution, understanding that there's a crisis and the crisis is a meta crisis. And that meta crisis emerges from about 10 different vectors. One of them is intense polarization. And we said that in response to the meta crisis, we need to do the crossing. We need to go from the crisis to the crossing. The crisis to the crossing. So what does it mean to go from the crisis to the crossing? So the person who models, my friends, going from the crisis to the crossing, and it's so good to be with you, right, in this, in this moment of both darkness and light. The person who models the movement from the crisis to the crossing, right, is a person an archetype, a, a force, a personhood, right, in history, who is madly beloved, both by the Christ traditions, by the Islamic traditions, by the Hebrew wisdom traditions, and finds his place deeply in Eastern traditions. And he's called Abraham of Hamon Goyim, right? He is the father source of nations across the globe. And of course, he has a, a different tr relationship to Western traditions. He appears more esoterically in Eastern traditions, but there's strong, strong esoteric traditions that locate, right, and find a direct link between the lineage of Abraham and the lineage of the East, Buddhist lineages, and Kashmir Shaivite Hindu lineages. This, we're not going to engage in that topic right now. So Abraham is this Av Hamun Goyim in the book of Genesis. He's the father, right, of many nations. And fatherhood in the best sense, in the sense of the blessing of the father. And Sarah is, is the matriarch, the mother. And Abraham engages in a movement. And that movement is, he lives in a moment of crisis. A moment in which the shadows right, of his moment in time need to be transcended. 
right? There are trances need to be ended, the ways of thinking, right? The old ways of being are cause of unimaginable suffering. Abram understands himself as being in this time between worlds and time between stories, and he hears a call. He hears a call. I tell you, stay with me. Okay, stay with me. Okay, he hears a call. Right, he hears a call. And what's the call that he hears? He hears a call, and the 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 interior scientists talk about this call, right, as a call that went out to every human being in reality. But Abraham hears it, and he responds. So it's not about who's called; it's about who responds. We're all called to be able to hear the call and to answer the call. What does it mean at this moment to answer the call? What does it mean to answer the call? So he hears the call, and the call is to move from the crisis to the crossing. Right? And the, the very word crossing, right, the very word crossing right, is Hebrew. Hebrew means crossing. And Hebrew means it has a second meaning. And the second meaning of the word Hebrew, Hebrew, aver, ivri, the second meaning of the word crossing is past. Right? Crossing also means past, avar, the past. So he moves from a memory of the past he moves from the repetition compulsion. We repeat the stories we were told in the past, and he steps beyond all previous lineages, and he feels this emergence, this new possibility, right? He feels this evolution of love, and he actually realizes, he feels this, he, he intuits, he senses, he remembers the future. And to move from the horror to the hope is to be able to access, right, a memory of the future. Does that make sense? Right? Talia, you still with me? Don't go away. Okay. So you're right, right? So, right, we'll be able to access the memory of the future. Okay. So stay close, right? It's beautiful, right? Here we go. So stay in. So stay in. Step at a time. Step at a time. Stay in. Relax your body. Open your body. Open. Spacious. Just feel it. So Abraham is mired in the past. He goes forth, he goes forth to his deepest self. There's a text, go forth to your deepest self. Lech lecha, go, lech, go forth, lecha, to your own deepest self, which is to the deeper vision of self that's coded in you, which is, right, Abraham's an early adopter. He's the very first incipient, right, glimmering, or one of them, one of the first incipient glimmerings, David Graeber would say in his book, The Dawn of Everything. He's a first incipient glimmering, right, of... Home one more. So he feels the crisis and he responds to the crisis with becoming a Hebrew, a boundary crosser. He breaks the boundary of the memories of the past and he accesses hope, which is a memory of the future. So aver Hebrew means crossing, but it means crossing from the past. The word E-V-E-R, aver, which is a three letter Hebrew root, it means Hebrew, it means past, and it means the crossing. So I move from the memories of the past to the memories of the future. Okay, so it's a moment of crossing, okay? Now, what's the nature of that crossing? What's the big name? Abraham, who is the father of all Islam, the father of all Hebrew wisdom, the father of the Christ traditions, right? A, 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 a critical formative figure in his lineage and transmitting right, to the East, right? Abraham is called by one master, Isaiah. Isaiah, one ma master of prophecy. Right? Master of vision, master of memories of the future. A prophet is one who is coded with memories of the future. When I feel homo amor in me, and every single person who's here today, we're here together because we feel homo amor in us. That's why we're here. We're called not because we're from the same family or from the same socioeconomic background or from the same racial background or from the same religious background or from the same geographic background or from the same political background or from the same sexual orientation background. That's not why we're together. What brings us together and that which right, unites us is much more fundamental than anything that divides us is that all of us, each of us here today, today, right now here, right, we're coded with this fluttering of homo amor, with this new possibility, right, with this memory of the future, okay? So now what, what's the nature of this memory? So Isaiah calls Abraham, Abraham Ohavi. Abraham is, is the lover. 
he loves loves God, but God has reality. Abraham loves reality. He loves the real, and he expands the boundaries of the real. Okay, so so let's see if we can try and find this, and then we're going to bring this directly into where we are today in the most, you know, precise, you know, so tender, such a tender way, and and, and it's going to be a little bit hard and a, and quivering tender. But let's go step at a time. So Abraham is the lover of the real. So what Abraham introduces is this notion, right, of, of being the lover. He's the lover, right? And the lover, not as a social construction, if you will, although the word social construction obviously didn't apply in ancient Mesopotamia, but 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 Abram was a lover in the sense that he understands that eros, that love, is, is the core nature of reality. And Abram transmits this knowing, right, to Isaac, right, to Jacob, to Sarah, Rebecca. Rachel to Leah, and there's this knowing. And that knowing ultimately goes to Egypt, and then there's an exodus from Egypt, and there's an entering right into, into the land, right? The land that's now the land right, that that is that is that is in the Middle East, at the center of the Middle East conflict today. And and there's a first commonwealth in that land, and it's right, the commonwealth of David. And David is David, the lover, David the lover, and he gives. He gives this transmission to Solomon, his son, and Solomon writes a book called The Song of Solomon, The Song of Songs. And The Song of Songs is the source of the Christ Mary Magdalene tradition. It's the source of the Islamic Sufi tradition, right, in many, many different ways. It's the source of, right, some of the most important and, and stunning traditions of compassion, right, in the East, right? It's the phenomenological source. It's the I'm not talking about the kind of precise historical source. That's that's an interesting question, but it's the phenomenological source. It's the source in human knowing, right? Human knowing. It's the anthroontological source, right? And the collective consciousness of humanity, this knowing that reality is eros. Or as Solomon said, toho ratsuf ahava, its insides are lined with love. That reality at its core, at its very, very, very essence, reality at its core is a love story. And that that's not a fairy tale, right? That's actually the, the true and essential notion of reality itself in its deepest being, okay? So with that in mind, David, give us the code, okay? With that in mind, okay, David, give us the code. With that, 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 we got that, we got that on the table, right? This realization that reality itself is a love story, its insides are aligned with love, the ontology of love. So with that in mind, David's gonna give us the code. Okay, take us inside, bro. Yeah, here we, here we go. We have this vision of possibility in this code. Moral complexity is the sign of homo amor. Moral equivalence is the failure of homo amor. The only way to move from the horror to the hope is the transformation from homo sapiens to homo amor. Homo amor means no less than a world religion of love from which no one it's excluded. I'll just read it one more time, let it sink in. Moral complexity is the sign of homo amor. Moral equivalence is the failure of homo amor. The only way to move from horror to the hope is the transformation from homo sapiens to homo amor. Homo amor means no less than a world religion of love from which no one is excluded. I turn my word back to you, Mark. Well, let's give each other heart soul. I think we can evolve the source code today. Like literally, like I think we can actually be in Florence at the center of the center and the deepest of the deep on the inside of the inside in this moment, right? In which we are in this crucible of outrageous pain and outrageous beauty and outrageous love. And I think we can actually evolve the source code. So reality is a love story. At its very core, meaning, meaning what drives reality is a sense of eros and eros at its core, eros at its core has these two qualities. And one is intimacy, this movement towards intimacy, meaning separate parts form larger holes, right? Shared identities. And these shared identities are the movement from 
apparent separation to larger union. So subatomic particles, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, ABB, create an atom. And unique atomic structures, Jamie, right? Unique chemicals, right? Irreducibly unique atomic structures, which means, right, they have a particular number of protons, that's the atomic number, right? Are, are the irreducible elements, those are the chemicals of reality, but chemicals are not mechanical. When we think chemical, we think mechanical. No, 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 reality is chemistry. And just like there's chemistry between beloveds at the human level, there's quite literally chemistry between beloveds all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain, right? Does everyone get that? And Kirsten, you and I wrote about that and, and, and Elena's now working with us on that and Jamie, we're working on that and they knew we worked on that and Zach and I right, have been working on that. So for the last seven, eight years, part of the core project of this new story of value, cosmorotic humanism, has been what I call the, the, the rereading of science, which I started doing myself. But I started the project late nights, like seven, eight years ago, intensively reading scientific papers one after the other and realizing that even though they were using precise and appropriate language, they were hiding what's actually happening. So when we talk about chemistry, right, or chemical compounds, chemical compounds means there's allurement between different chemicals. Each chemical is a particular structure of intimacy. That's actually what it is. It's a particular relationship between protons, neutrons, and electrons in particular numbers and a particular configurations and arrangements. So there's patterns and an atom, an atomic structure is a pattern of intimacy. When you take two different atoms or irreducible chemical elements, you put them together, you create something which is undeniably new, right? But you, you don't put them together. They put themselves together because they're allured to each other. They're drawn to each other by chemistry, right? So the same chemistry that brought all of us together, we're here together because we're allured to each other. It's deeper than rational. It's not a surface allurement, it's a clarified allurement, right? We, we sense something, we, there's a sense of trust between us, there's a sense of being drawn to each other. There's a sense that there's a larger whole that we can create, which we can't do individually. So we, we come together to create a larger collective intimate communion. Right? That's what we are, that's what One Mountain Many Paths is. And we're part of, we're an expression of, this chemistry that defines cosmos all the way down and all the way up the evolutionary chain. Reality is chemistry and chemistry is allurement. And allurement is a precise balance between allurement, attraction and autonomy, repulsion. And that precise balance is what's called love. And that's the story of reality, right? Reality is a love story. Now, that's part one. Now let's go, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? We're just getting started. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we awake? Okay, are, who's, who's ready to just give it all? Let's, right now, we are now on the ground, right, in the revolution, right? And what we have to just do is we have to invade any part of our hearts that are not clarified, any heart of, part of our hearts that are lost in a kind of ethnocentric, egocentric bias, right? That are lost in, 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 a, in, in some vision of the world that keeps people out, right? That, that actually excludes anyone from the love story, right? We're actually engaged in a tantric act now. And tantra means, tantra means what? What does tantra mean? Non-rejection, no one's outside the circle. So we're doing, we're doing now, we're gonna, we're gonna invade the distorted versions of the ground of being, right? With aza, right? Gaza means aza, aza means outrageous audacity. So we wanna invade with outrageous audacity any part of reality, right? Any part of the ground. Right, which excludes any human being, right, from right the circle of love and the circle of intimacy. Okay, so here we are. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? We, but we got to give it all. Right, we can't like it's not like an easy listening channel. We're going all the way in. I'll go all the way in if you meet me all the way in. Okay, so are we ready to play a larger game? We're ready to play a larger game. Are we ready, quite literally, to participate, right, in the evolution of love? And the way I participate in the evolution of love, and here's the next step, is I recognize that A, reality is a love story. It means reality is a, is a story about intimacy. Reality is a story that 
that describes the movements in an intimate universe. Okay, and like any story, we ready? Like any story, reality has a plot line. What's the plot line? The plot line of reality, based on the deepest reading of the sciences, exterior sciences and interior sciences, is that reality is the progressive deepening of intimacies. Or, said differently, reality is relationships, right? which is another way of saying the same thing. Reality is relationships. But then, it's not just relationships, reality is evolution, because the movement of evolution, the progressive evolving, moving to higher and deeper unions, more intimacies, is the movement of reality. So reality is evolution, and reality is the evolution of relationships. Okay, that's the ground. That's the ground of this new story of value, which is cosmoerotic humanism. Now let's stay close because now it starts to get wild and beautiful and precise. And, and, and we're going to get directly back, right? We're going to find ourselves in the middle, right, of, of the land of Israel, Palestine again. But let's go slow. So reality is a love story, but reality is also a love story. Well, it's not also. Reality is the love story, like any love story, like any story with a plot line. So reality is not merely a fact, reality is a story. Reality is not an ordinary story, reality is a love story. Reality is not an ordinary love story, it's an outrageous love story, an evolutionary love story. And by that we mean that love is the animating eros of reality itself. It, it is the plot line of reality. So the plot line of reality is the evolution of love, right? Does everyone, can everyone just kind of feel a little bit how we got there? You don't need all the details if you've never been with us before, but just give me a yes in the chat box. If you've been with us, studied us before, you just get the general sense of how we got there. Okay, and we've, we've written now probably seven or eight volumes of a couple hundred thousand words each, right, validating that. But just give me a sense of we're just kind of feel how we got there, okay? Okay, good. So reality is the evolution of love, okay? So now, let's see if we can get this, okay? So what does the evolution of love mean, okay? What does the evolution of love mean, okay? So the evolution of love means that I leave behind old versions of the love story and new, more evolved versions of the love story emerge, okay? So reality is the story of the intimate universe. That's what it is. We live in an intimate universe, right? R reality is governed by tenets of intimacy. And one of the forthcoming volumes in the Great Library defines the tenets of intimacy, right? There's about 50 tenets of intimacy. Right, and in the the upcoming book that I'm about to to share, um, you know, that I actually I'm I, I haven't written it. It was written by David J. Temple, right, who's a pseudonym, but expressing kind of the work that we're doing here at the center. And Zach and I have been, you know, talking to David, our pseudonym, right, you know, intensely for about a decade, and lots of us have been in the conversation in different ways. So David's about to put out right a book, right, you know, which is a first book we call the Tip of the Spear of the Great Library you know, kind of telling the story and it begins to talk about intimacy. And, and then there'll be another book and another and Kirsten and I are working hard on one set and, and Elena's working in a, in a different vector. And there's, you know, Christina and Kristen, and David and the whole gang on evolutionary sense making, right? There's, you know, there's multiple vectors and we're all involved in this, every one of us. There's no one who's not, right? You know, who's not here deeply, who's not involved in, in telling this new story, okay? So from the perspective of this new story of value, this, right, what do we understand? So if the universe is a love story, or it's a story of intimacy, it's a story of the intimate universe and reality's intimacy all the way up and all the way down. And intimacy means very specific things. We have interior science formulas that define what does eros mean? What does intimacy mean? I'm not gonna go into the formulas right now, but just intimacy as a structure of shared identity in the context of otherness, in which there's, or mutualities of recognition and mutualities of feeling and mutualities of value and mutualities of purpose. That's what intimacy means. Right? That defines the subatomic world, defines the world of self, it defines the biological world and all of its facets. It defines the economic world. All of reality is governed by these tenets of intimacy. So if something is askew in reality, if something's, if evolution is stalling or if evolution is, 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 is not able to find its way forward, or if evolution is having a momentary regression, as you will, if you will, right? In other words, that's because there's something askew in the plot line. There's what we've called a, a, a global intimacy disorder. 
right? So if there's a meta crisis in which, in which, right, all of the forward movement of evolution stalls, and then because of an exponential increase in exterior technologies, which is not matched by an increase in under, under our understanding of what intimacy means, me meaning something breaks down in the love story. So exponential technologies of power, right, increase, and the love story stops short. The love story doesn't keep evolving, right? The, the, the vision of intimacy breaks down, right? Right, there's a global intimacy disorder and right? we can't find each other. We don't have a shared field of value. And then that global intimacy disorder becomes the root of the meta crisis. So up to now, this is, we've talked about all this, right? This is in a certain sense, I'm just kind of bringing us in, okay? Stay, stay close, stay close. Benjamin, stay close. We're just gonna go, we're gonna move forward now, okay? Stay close. So another way to say this, okay, friends? Another way to say this. Another way to say this is, so this is all context background, okay? Another way to say this is, is that the breakdown or a dimension of the crisis today, right, is directly related to what I would call failed love stories, okay? And what I want to suggest is that actually you cannot understand Hamas, you can't understand the failures of the Chinese Communist Party, you can't understand the failures of kind of the world's technocratic order, kind of the elites of kind of globalism, which are three different sectors. You can't understand any of them without an understanding that actually the breakdowns of reality right, are, stay close, friends, stay very, very close, stay very, very close, are failed love stories. Now, I, I want to try and create a context for this. All of reality is a love story. That's what reality is. As we've said many times in cosmorotic humanism, right, stay close, and, and love and power are intimately related, but stay close. As, as we pointed out in cosmorotic humanism, my personal story is chapter and verse in the universal love story. So my personal story is chapter and verse in the universal love story. Okay? So that which powers my life, what actually powers my life is a desire for connection. Right? For connection to reality. So I'm going to make meaning of reality. I want to be aligned with the structure of reality. I don't want to be separate with the field of reality. Right? I, I want to feel not isolated from others. So I, I move, I'm allured to. I don't move rationally, right? It's not a, a merely rational actor. I'm allure, an allured actor. I'm drawn out of my loneliness to create relationship, both with the field of reality, with the deeper visions of self that live in me, and with other. With, and all of those are beloveds, right? The field of reality is, is a beloved, right? My, my circle of beloveds are beloved. Right, the deeper split off levels of my deeper self are beloveds. So I'm allured to create deeper knowing. Right? Knowing is an erotic word. Adam knew his wife Eve. Deeper gnosis, deeper knowing with my circle of beloveds. Okay, that's the, the structure of reality. So my personal love story, right? I have a personal love story, participates in the universal love story. And they're both governed. Now stay close. They're both governed in the same way. Does everyone get that? They're both governed. Just like I have a personal love story. So there's a collective love story, right? There's reality, a love story. There's the love story of the universe. There's the, what we call the cosmo erotic universe. And just like in a personal love story, I can have a limited love story. Right? There's a limit. My, my love story is limited. Or I can have an abusive love story. Or I can have a pathological love story. So too, now everyone beginning to see where we're going now, right? Now you begin to get a hint of, right? right. So, so too in the collective, right? In the, in the body politic, not just in the body of my life, but in the body politic, right? The body politic is, is a love story because the body politic is an expression of the universal love story. And those love stories can actually be either accurate or limited, 
right? Or distorted, distorted love stories, degraded love stories, right? In other words, they can be abusive love stories. They can be pathological love stories. Did everyone begin to get what we're saying? So in other words, let me try and let me try and draw it in. Okay, see if we can die. Take a deep breath. Let's go deep now for a second. Okay, let's go deep for a second. Let's go really deep. So the structure of reality is eros. The structure of reality is an intimate universe. One. Right? The structure of reality is a love story. Another way to say it. Two. Okay, now stay close. So then, two. The plot line of the story is the evolution of love. The evolution of intimacy. That's two. Three. That love story can break down. Okay. That love story can break down. Does everyone get the love story can break down? The love story can either break down because it doesn't evolve, so it remains limited, number one, or the love story can break down because, right, it gets distorted, it gets degraded, right? Two, right, it can break down because it becomes pathological, right? It's pathological in that it acts out, it becomes destructive, right, in a terrible way, okay? So the love story can either remain limited or it can degrade, Right? It can pathologize. Right? It can become or be internally in its own nature abusive. Okay. So I want to just kind of just try and just talk about that a little bit. What does that mean? Okay. So what's a limited love story? Okay. And there's a difference. And I want, I want to understand it differently because we need to understand what is a limited love story and how do we evolve beyond a limited love story? What does that actually mean? So let's go slow. So let's let's go from the world of matter, right, which is animated by eros, by allurement. We've talked about the subatomic, atomic, molecular world, the world of chemistry and the world of matter. We've already talked about that, right? That world of chemistry, right, of eros governs, right, all of the biological world, which if you read Freud carefully, especially in his later work, Descent, right, he talks all about not natural selection, he talks about sexual selection. And sexual selection is the eros Right, the allurement, right, the movement towards right union. And natural selection itself really is a story about being allured to and bonded with my environment, right? With the larger environment that I'm in. Right. And, and, and so so if you really understand it carefully, right, then you understand right the much deeper versions of, of evolution, right, that are way beyond the kind of dead versions of neo-Darwinism. The materialist neo-Darwinism has really died, as Dennis Noble, the Oxford professor of systems biology, has already pointed out. If you have a much deeper version, read James Shapiro, Evolution for the 21st Century, right? You, you begin to understand this idea, originally seated, seated by many thinkers, but one of them was Lynn Margulis, right? Of a kind of living universe. The universe is alive all the way up and all the way down, and it's it's animated, although they don't use this word. Right, they're 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 speaking in more formal terms of science, but it's animated by eros. We we got that, we understand that. But let's jump to the human world, okay? Let's jump from the biosphere to the noosphere, the world of of knowing, right? The world of of interior knowings, the depth of the self-reflective human mind. So we've we've said many times that in the human world, you can actually trace the evolution of love. And let's just take a look at the last thousand years, okay? So at the human level, we can actually discern the evolution of love. Okay, and now, in a certain sense, everything we've done today was for this next 10 minutes. Okay, this is where we had to set the context in order to kind of get us in here. So I tried to set 10 hours of context in 20 minutes to try and just kind of touch the general context, but now we're in. Okay, so in the human level, at the human level, right, let's say at the collective human level, at the collective human level, and at the personal human level, we can actually talk about an evolution of love. Okay, so I'm going to give you two examples of the evolution of love at the human level. Okay, and then we're going to get to the, the wild, crazy, hard, painful, but also, also painfully beautiful stuff. Okay, but let's just start with the human level. So at the human level, we've had, we can have an experience at the human level of being egocentric, which means that my circle of intimacy, the people I'm willing to sacrifice for, that I care for, that I'm willing to bracket my ego self for and to support in, in radical ways of devotion, right, that I have a felt sense of care and concern is me and my survival people, all right? So that's me and my immediate, you know, my immediate few people around me, my little hunting band, okay? And then we can, we can have a, an evolution of love where I expand the circle, 
where I actually have a sense of felt care and concern for my larger group of people. So if my friend Walter is here, it might be for TORFs, the TORF family. Wow, I'm committed to my, my family and my family organization, right? And we're, we're going to build together. We might build, I don't know, a, 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 a center for education in Nepal. Right. We might stand for 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 evolving the source code for Homo Amor. But in other words, I'm with my family. OK, my cohort. Right. My tribe. That's beautiful. And, and my tribe might be my religion. Right. And it might be my nationality. Right. And we have this sense of this ethnocentric sense. OK. And there's there's a healthy and beautiful ethnocentric sense. And of course, there's a shadow ethnocentric sense. And the shadow is the limitation is I only feel a sense of felt care, love, and concern for the people in that circle. And anyone else outside the circle, either I don't care about, or I need to kill them or conquer them or subjugate them until they agree with my vision of the nature of reality, okay? Which is what much of classical, traditional ethnocentrism was, Right. As exemplified, for example, in the great battles of the Islamic and Christian movements called the Crusades, where they massacre and slaughter each other, right? Each for a right, a, a, a sense that God's only ultimately concerned with our people. And of course, even in the midst of that, there were voices like, like Saladin, like like the King of Jerusalem for a short period of time, who actually saw beyond it and they they, they began to vision a deeper, a, a better, a more beautiful world. And that more beautiful world was this world of world-centric intimacy, world-centric love. I actually have a felt sense of care and concern for every human being on the planet, right? We are the people, right? 1985, Live Aid concert, right? right? And, and, and we have to feed every person, okay? That's world-centric intimacy, right? So that's an evolution of love. And then I actually begin to include also the animals. And I I stop eating factory farm meat from animals that are radically abused, right? And I actually have a sense of identity with the, the cosmos itself, right? I'm actually identified with the evolutionary impulse of the cosmos moving through me. And I begin to actually feel a love for cosmos, right? A love for all of reality, a love for all the different peoples that might exist in cosmos. So I might make a movie called Avatar, right? About a love affair between a Marine, right? And a Navi priestess living right on on a planet in a different part of the galaxy. And, in, and you know, epics of culture like Star Wars or like Star Trek or like Avatar, right? And, and, and the entire world of science fiction is envisioning that cosmocentric world. Does that make sense? So these are evolutions of love. That's an evolution of love on the collective level. Now, on the personal level, Raquel talked about the personal love story. On the personal level, Right, I may have a very, very limited, right, primitive sense of love, right, with my family because I just identify with them. They're just they're just part of my reality. But I might deepen that love by disidentifying with them and actually individuating and then establishing much deeper relationships with my mother, right? Right, with my sister, with my brother, right, with my father, right? In other words, so I can, within my family system, I can have an automatic relationship, right? Kind of level one identification. And then I can developmentally disidentify with my family, individuate, right? Individuate, right? I kind of have a sense of my own autonomy. And then I can reintegrate with my larger family system and, and actually develop a deeper sense of love with everyone in the family. Same thing's true about my relationship to myself, right? I can actually be in relation to myself and be committed to my own survival, but not actually have, and virtually no one does, unless you actually work, do the deep work of, of awakening, which is deep work. It's the work of a lifetime where actually I'm, I'm living in my body, but I don't love myself. And actually most of the parts of myself are split off, right? And I'm, I, I can't actually feel them and I can't live them and I can't breathe them. They're in exile, right? And then I deepen my relationship to myself by actually bringing back home split off parts and getting to know them and becoming friends with them and becoming intimate with them. And I reestablish intimacy with split off parts of myself. And then I intensify the depth of my love with my, my overall self by intensifying my intimacy with those split off parts. So that's an evolution of love. Everyone tracking with me? 
That's an evolution of love that takes place within myself. So we've just charted three evolutions of love. One that takes place in the collective, one that takes place, for example, in a family system, and the third takes place within the self system. Three, three tracks of the evolution of love, okay? Now, stay close, friends. Stay close. Now here it gets very, very, and again, everything was to get to here. And I, I thank everyone for the patience. But now, now we go in. Now we go in. So an arresting of development, when I arrest development, when I get stuck at an evolutionary level, right, inappropriately, when I freeze frame at that level, I pathologize at that level. I can't move beyond that level. So much of Freudian thought is about how you can free phrase freeze frame at a particular level. So Freud talks about, you know, the Oedipal level, or he talks about the anal, right, the anal level, right, when a person becomes, right, anal, right, and it becomes kind of obsessive, compulsive, a kind of anal retentive level. So I'm not going to go into Freudian thought, but Freud was about how you actually biologically in your biophysical organism, right, how you get stuck, right, moored, right, stuck, can't, can't progress, Right, evolution stalls in your own personal development and you get stuck at a developmental level, which actually, although you look like you've grown beyond it, you haven't. And it's distortions distort your ability to love yourself, to love others, to be in relationship to reality. Okay. So this notion, right, of the evolution of is critical. Now for Freud, Freud looked at it in a kind of mechanical, you know, way, because Freud was you know, he, he there's, there, there's not what Freud was. There were many different strains of Freud's writing, his early writing, his later writing, his middle writing. He often self-contradicts in the middle of one essay. But at least Freud's kind of stated position is he was a kind of materialist. But, you know, and he, he kind of understood the human being and kind of as a kind of steamboat, a kind of mechanical system, a.k.a. the Descartes tradition, which shaped and formed him, which was so dominant in the West that 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 defined the, the zeitgeist to Freud. But if you understand more deeply what we've said, that reality is actually a love story, that Eros is actually, Eros actually is the quality of reality itself, and that, that I'm participatory in that field of Eros, and that every individual is, and that every collective is, we're expressions of that larger field of Eros, and that that field of Eros is a story, it's a, it's a love story, and it has a plot line, so in that plot line, there can be arrested development, okay? So arrested development can take place in multiple ways, right? It can take place in my personal love story where I, I, I arrest my development. I'm, I'm unable to move beyond a certain version of love, right? a certain very child, a childlike version of love, right? I love my parents because they bring me candy on Christmas and Hanukkah and Ramadan, Right or on you know a particular you know Buddhist or Kashmir Shaivite holiday or Native Indian holiday, and if they don't bring me candy, right, then I don't love them anymore. And so I love my parents because they take care of me. But if it seems like they're not taking care of me the way I should be taken care of, I don't love them anymore. Right. So that's a a primitive, right? And I wouldn't call it conditional. Love's always because conditions change. Right. That's why you got to be careful in editing. Right. 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 And that's already giving it a much bigger word. I would say right. In other words, I link love to primitive conditions that are completely context dependent, which my parents often can't control. Okay. So stay close. All right. So I can arrest my love at that development, but another place I can arrest my love. You with me, everyone, I can arrest my love at ethnocentric. In other words, my love is only for my people. That's one, right? And I can't love actually, I don't know how to love beyond my people ethnocentric, right? That's a tragedy of ethnocentric. Or now stay close to me, if you're very, very close, I only love, okay? I only love, I only love, right? Right, or care, right? Loving, caring, right? Right, nurturing, right? Right, absolutely, right? Loving, caring, nurturing, right? I, I only love, care for, nurture my son or my daughter. Does everyone see that? All right, and as my love arrests, now, I want to get really, really clear here. It's completely legitimate to, to have ethnocentric love. I mean, I love my people. That's beautiful. But if my love arrests there, in other words, if love means love of self and love of my people, then ultimately, 
I'm no longer in the universal love story. In other words, my love story is now decontextualized from the larger plot line of reality. So the plot line has become degraded. The plot line has veered, right? In other words, I'm no longer in the larger play, but actually my subplot, right, has optimized itself. And when my subplot optimizes itself, instead of working together with a larger body or the larger body politic, and I work to only proliferate myself or my tribe, and I don't understand that I'm part of a larger plot line of a larger love story, then I get cancerous cells. I get cancers in the body politic, okay? So again, ethnocentric love can be beautiful, but ethnocentric love has gotta be in the context of a larger love story. And the love of my son, Right, and I, I want to kind of really just understand this deeply. I love my kids madly, okay? Right, I love my kids madly. I love my son Zion, right, deeply. Right, and my my son Yair and my son Eitan, right, and 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 my daughter Rachel. And each of them has their own lives, and each each of those stories is, of course, like always, right, a story. But I want to say something dramatic. I don't have the right to love my son in a way that would cause me to educate him to act in a way which would say that only his life or those of his contemporaries, right, in his tribe matter, and he would have a right to abuse or violate the lives of others. That, that I can't do. And it's, I love my son madly and insanely, but I cannot say that my son's life is more precious than the life of another family in my tribe or the life of another family with their son outside my tribe. Right? And one of my teachers, one of my masters who died about 150 years ago on his deathbed, he says, I want to atone for the sin of loving my son more than any other son. And this is what he meant. It's, I don't have a right, I wanna get this really clear, to love my son intrinsically. I can have a more felt sense of my son, right? I can be more responsible, right, you know, in an immediate way to make sure that he can, you know, help him make a living, right? And, you know, when, if he wants to come, you know, spend a month with me, right, you know, right? Oh my God, right? He can come at any time he wants, day or night, right? So I've got, I've got an immediate care for him, which is an immediate obligation of care. And I have a direct line to him and a felt sense of care. And that's beautiful. That's fine. That's beautiful. But, but ultimately, I've got to be madly committed to my biological son or to my tribal son, but I can't arrest my love there. Does everyone get this? I can, that's an arresting of love. Right. And, and if, if I arrest it there in a kind of passive way, then I'm just an ordinary human being and seems OK. But actually, when we live in a world in which we're intimately connected with each other and it's a global world, right, then actually that kind of passive, ordinary limitation of love can become lethal. In other words, I actually have to have a felt sense of love inside of me that says that the, the child right, of a Palestinian mother held hostage by Hamas, hostage meaning just by living in Gaza, right? and her son, who's the same age as my son, I have to feel her son like I feel my son. That's what it means to be home Walmart, okay? That's what it means to be home Walmart, okay? So let's just feel this, okay? Feel this, okay? So that means that I need to teach my son, right, that he has to be not just ethnocentric, but world centric. That's my obligation to my son. I've got to teach him that actually you have to have a felt sense of love, care, and concern, right, for every human being on the planet. And you have to have a relationship, right, 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 to every human being on the planet. And that doesn't mean that we obliterate tribes, tribes are beautiful. 
But tribes operate in a unique self-symphony and the unique self-symphony is the intrinsic value of every human being and no one's outside the circle, right? And I can't just operate as, I can't form my policy or my politics of love, right? If my politics are gonna be a politics of love, right? right? If we're gonna actually enact a new world where we move from homo sapien to homo amor, which means that we actually wanna enact a religion of love, a world religion of love, a world religion of love can't be just a world religion of love because that could be ethnocentric love. It's got to be a world religion of world-centric and cosmocentric love. And I have to be willing to love my son madly, but not exclusively. I need to actually be able to not just love, but to care for, okay? And I'm going to ask everyone to try and follow me, right, in the thread. Try and stay with me. Stay with me. I want to keep the thread on. I don't want to turn it off. But I'm going to ask everyone just to try and so we can actually be in the conversation together and follow the thread. Then we'll have plenty of room to hear everything and everyone else. Okay. So we're doing great. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just like track with this. Okay. Because it's a very dramatic thing to say. We think, oh, it's okay. Right. A couple of people wrote me this week, dear friends of mine. And they said, oh, we get it. You're kind of a father. You're a grandfather. Your son's life is in danger. So, so the way you think about things must be shaped and formed by that. Well, first off, everything's shaped and formed by our biographies. Of course it is. Right. So, yes. And no, 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 no. The whole point of being homo amor is that I actually have to love your son like I love my son. That's that's what it means to be homo amor. It's big. OK. Because there's nothing more dangerous. Than a distorted love story. OK, they're all our children. They're all our children, right? And I'm, I need to actually be able to feel literally in my body. Now, stay with me for a second, okay? So one of the things that Derek Parfit, who was a moral realist, right, philosopher at Oxford, pointed out that when I think about where I distribute my income, right, where I distribute my, my resource, I can't distribute my resource just to my biological family. And so here, I'm going to be a little bit sharp for a second. So I apologize, everyone. So if you have, I'm just making this up. Okay. If you have hundred dollars of resources and your plan is when I die, I'm going to leave 95 to my kids and $5, right. To the rest of the world. So then you are ethnocentric in a bad way. Right. In other words, meaning my job is to do my best to enact, right. You know, beautiful possibilities for my children. Yes. I should do that. I should take care of my children. I should invest in my children and help them get an, you know, an apartment if I can and, and create relationships for them to actually find their own unique self-creativity. That's all good. But actually, right, if I have significant resources, I want to actually look and say, where can I distribute those effectively in the world right, to make the whole world right, a better place? Because I love the whole world. That's one. But two, you know, emerging from Derek Parfit's kind of moral thinking right, is what came to be called effective altruism. And effective altruism said, wow, let's try and think if, my, if I'm standing on the side of life, if I'm all in for all life, what's the most effective use of my resources to save the most lives? And that might not be my local charity. Maybe getting malaria nets, right, you know, and, and deploying them in particular places in the world will actually alleviate more suffering and save more lives than anything else. So I'm not, effective altruism is not entirely correct, but they're raising important issues, right? And so the philosophers of effective altruism, Derek Parfit's students raised here important issues. And Peter Singer, for example, right, is a, a moral philosopher who's raising these kinds of issues. Meaning, how do I actually become homo amor? Right now, it's not that I should make a rational calculus without feeling or desire. That's one of the mistakes of effective altruism. They become almost, that they actually dissociate from the felt sense of desire and love. And, and they try and operate based on Derek Parfit's moral realism, but it's a moral realism which takes feeling out of the equation and try and, tries to make kind of scientific moral calculus. So that's the weakness of that way of thinking, right? You actually do need to take feeling into account. You, need to, you, need, you do need to take proximity into account. And, and you do have a different relationship to your son than you do to other people. That's all true. That's good. Effective altruism went too far because they took feeling and desire and eros and allurement out of the equation entirely, which you can't do. 
Having said that, they were pointing to something important, which is you actually also need to evolve your feeling. I need to evolve my capacity for allurement. I need to evolve my capacity to feel, right? I need to be able to feel wider. So I need to be able to feel not only, not only the, the, the roads of the Hebrew settlements, right? That live, for example, in Judea Samaria, which I know well, right? I also need to feel, right, the, the beautiful Palestinian towns like Kelkilia, which I know very well, right? On the West Bank, right, right near Kfar Saba. And so I used to walk around the streets of Kelkilia, one of the four major centers of the West Bank and just get to know everyone and talk to everyone and, and go to weddings and, and go to my dentist there and, and have friends there. And I walked around, you know, without a machine gun, right? Intentionally, although I was told by the security officer at the settlement, where I was a rabbi, that that was insane. But I said, no, no, I'll be insane. Let's be insane, okay? So we have to feel each other. And I've got to evolve. And if my love story breaks down, my personal love story can break down, right? Or my, my collective love story can break down, okay? And, and, and actually, I'm gonna add two more pieces. So we'll get to where we wanna go and we'll, we'll stop, okay? Can, can we go a couple more steps? How are we doing, everyone? I'm gonna to get to kind of the core. We're just, we're just about there. How are we doing? Can we go a couple more steps? Okay, so stay close. Okay, let's go a couple more steps here. And it gets, it gets very, very dramatic and very, very powerful, right? And let's try and find this for a second. Okay, a distorted love story, distorted and abusive love stories. What's in a, a distorted and abusive love story? It's a story in which I've split off part of myself and the part of myself that I've split off is essential. And I've degraded that part of myself. I've distorted it. I've split off my relationship to it. And therefore, I, I, I've lost my ability to trust myself. And that's not the only form of a pathological or abusive love story, but it's one form. Now, one dimension of myself I want to talk about, right, in this context, and we said there's, there's, there's at least three vectors of distorted or degraded love stories. There's a, a distorted collective love story which can arrest at ethnocentric development where I only feel and I only sacrifice for my child and my son, right? There's a, a distorted, right? Or abusive or degraded or pathological personal love story, right? So for example, I love my mother and hate my father and my mother hated my father. So I internalize my hatred, my mother's hatred of my father and I hate my father and my relationship to my mother is based on us hating my father together. And we actually, I actually can't see my father, right? So I've, I've actually internalized my mother, let's say, has a pathologized relationship to my father. I internalize her pathologized relationship, right? And I, I, together with my mother, I hate my father and my mother smothers me and I actually can't breathe and I can't actually find my autonomy and I can't find my own sense of choice. And my mother's actually degrading right, my own sense of selfness. But actually, I feel like, right, only if I give her that level of loyalty and obedience... Will she live? And she's holding her living as a threat, right, to my very heart and soul. But I, I surrender myself anyways because I'm afraid to be the cause of her death. So I join her in the hatred of my father, right? You begin to get, I'm, I'm, I'm creating a character scenario kind of spontaneously, but that's an abusive love story. And I'm, I'm madly in love with my mother. Right, you got that, Benjamin, right? But, but actually it's an abusive love story. It's an abusive love story. So there's, there's many forms. Right, of abusive love stories and personal love stories. And then I can have an abusive love story, a pathological love story, a distorted love story, a, a degraded love story vis-a-vis -vis myself because I've split off essential parts of myself. So within that context, one essential part of myself that I will split off is my own sense of desire. Right, The, the, the feeling of allurement and desire that runs through, that lives in my body. I can split that off. And for my friends, you know, Mati and um, James and, and Walter, my, my, my beautiful Belgian friends, it was this part, this last 10 minutes of this next 10 minutes that, that I really wanted to. You know, so I know that you guys sometimes, I love you guys madly, you sometimes get to kind of the first hour and not to this part. So it's this part that's for you, my friends, right? My beloved, my brothers, right? Right, homo amor, right? Fab four homo amor, right? right? It's just for us. So if I split off my relationship, right, to my field of desire, right, to the allurement that runs in me, 
it means I can't trust myself anymore. Do you understand that? And that's the beginning of totalitarianism. And totalitarianism at its core is a distorted love story, right? Orwell's 1984, central to Orwell's 1984, right? His novel is what he called the Ministry of Love because it's 1984 totalitarianism is a distorted love story. Mussolini, when he writes about fascism is writing about distorted love stories, okay? And most forms of fascism and totalitarianism, Nazism, the National Socialist Party was a distorted love story, right? A failed, distorted, pathologized, degraded love story, right? If I am in Israel and I have a, 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 a sense that messianic politics should determine the course of my policy, that is a distorted and degraded love story, for sure. Right. If I am a senator from the United States and instead of basing my backing of the Ukraine against Russia on a shared ground of value that we all share, but I'm actually basing it on right, a sense that since Putin is the Antichrist in this particular set of prophecies where right, will be fulfilled, right, if we back Ukraine in a particular way, right, well, then I'm involved in a distorted love story. Right? And as we should back Ukraine in a way that's fantastic and beautiful, I'm completely in favor of backing Ukraine. I think Ukraine and Israel need to stand together. And it's a place that Israel didn't show up the way it should have because of a complex relationship to Putin and controlling the airspace in its northern border. That's a bracket, different conversation. But I can't be using Ukraine to fulfill my Christological right, anticipation because then I become not trustworthy in policy. Okay? So that's, that's a distorted love story, right? In other words, a healthy love story is when, when I understand that reality is a love story. We're all in a shared ground of value. There's a shared field of eros. Eros itself is value. Eros is eros value. No one's outside of the field. Ukraine's in the field and Russia's in the field and China's in the field. Right? There's no one who's intrinsically outside of the field. It's not a Christ field and everyone's going to come to Christ. And it's not an Allah field and everyone's going to come to Allah, right? Uh, no, it's not a Tibetan Buddhist field and everyone's going to come to Tibetan Buddhism. And it's not a Hebraism field and everyone's going to come to Hebraism. Now, that's, that's, uh, now I'm, not, I'm not on a love story anymore. I'm now in a distorted subplot where I'm, I'm actually sub-optimizing the love story for my own distorted vision, okay? So if you really want to understand, friends, what's going on now in Israel, all of this was to get here. What's going on in Israel, and there's not a moral equivalence, right? There's not a moral equivalence, right? That's, that's not the case. There's not a moral equivalence. What's going on, and, and there's tragedy all around, and we, we hold our, our hearts shattered for, for anyone, any innocent civilians that are killed despite very real, huge efforts. I was involved in directly and indirectly in, in Gaza in 2014, where Israel made tens and tens of thousands of phone calls, calling people's cell phones, asking them to evacuate. Right? There's an impossible situation, 2000, you know, according to B'Tselem, right, incidents have been killed in Gaza, which is tragic beyond imagination. Right? And as the Dalai Lama pointed out when we talked about it, right, this is, there's not a moral equivalence here. Right? That's not, it's not, Right? Israel's responding to targeting civilians for the most brutal atrocities possible right? by a group that does not represent the Palestinian people, that holds Palestinians hostage and killed. Right? There's a civil war and Hamas killed right, the naturally chosen Palestinian leadership. And 62% of the Palestinians in Gaza wanted Hamas right, not to attack Israel. So let's understand that. So, we're, But I want to look particularly at the Hamas issue right now. I want to look particularly at the Hamas issue and just try and understand what's actually happening here. And I want to play you a clip for a second, okay? I want to play you a clip. And this is the place I wanted to get. Okay, we just have just 10 more minutes. Okay, Christiane, we'll finish together. Okay, let's get here. Here we go. So I want to play you a clip. So Krista, I want you to, this is a, there's no visuals in this clip. So I'm not going to play you a, a clip of, of painful visuals, which, and I think we shouldn't be showing painful visuals all over the web. And I think that's, that's a huge problem in, in, in kind of a capitalist social media, you know, vicious enterprise. We're essentially showing snuff films all over the web, which is horrific. I'm not going to show anything like that. It actually has only voice, 
but I want you to listen to the voice. It takes about two minutes. We're going to spend our last five minutes talking about this. So let's take a look. Okay. Okay, right? You can barely breathe, my friends. Right? So listen to that. Listen to that, my friends. So this is a boy, 20 years old, 25 years old, who's calling his dad, saying, I killed 10 Jews. God's grace. Now, we would expect him to be unbearably ugly. But he's not even unbearably ugly. Right? It's, there's no words for it. Right? He says, Dad, will you be proud of me? Mom, Mom, will you be proud of me? Dad, right? Return. I was like, oh my God, right? Oh my God, you feel that? So this is a distorted love story. This is a failed love story. This is an abusive love story. This is a pathologized love story. It's, it's a pathologized love story in which killing 10 Jews with my bare hands, right? Brutally, right? Is love of Allah and love of my particular people. And it earns me the love of my mother and the love of my father, right? And the father says, did you kill 10 Jews? He says, return, return already. And the mother's just crying, right? It's critical to understand. You know, I talked about what, my colleague, Marin Williamson, the, the left-wing social writer called the pure evil of Hamas. And, and Marin's, of course, right in terms of the actions. And I compared in that sense, you know, Hamas to orcs in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And Elena correctly reminded me that if you read Tolkien, Tolkien actually has a confused, I, I looked up my Tolkien, right, uh, this week, and Tolkien in several places, this is my scholarly side, you know, has different understandings of the ideology, the origin of orcs, right, the beasts of Sauron who, who commit these mass atrocities. But, but in some sense, the orcs are actually distorted versions or expressions of the original elves, right? The original elves. But here's the thing, and I say this to Dave, Dave says, it's hard to fathom this distorted reality, right? But here's the thing, Dave, right? And I totally get it, Dave, of course it is, of course, brother, okay? But let's get this clearly, right? If your experience of reality is a liberal, secular experience, right? And you've never actually experienced the passion of feeling the love story of the universe, Right, then you actually can't even begin to understand this. And you might think, well, okay, if this is what it leads to, that would be better not to ever feel this. But actually, that's actually not the case. Now stay really, really close with me. In other words, 
the position that says that there is no love story, says there is no field of Eros value, right? Actually creates a world of ultimate relativism where there's no field of value at all. So communism was an expression of that. And communism created its own pseudo passions. And between Russian and Chinese communism, right? More people were killed in the 20th century than all of the religious wars put together by far. So the collapsing of the field of value doesn't work. Can't collapse the field of value, right? Communism became a secular materialist distorted love story and it was the love of the state. You also can't pathologize a love story and say the love story is for a particular people who have a particular set of beliefs and anyone outside of that set of beliefs right, is to be destroyed, which is the position of Hamas, which is why Hamas's culture is, right? The love of death, right? They actually say, we love death like you love life. Because, right, our love story is death and martyrdom in order to serve this particular vision of the divine. Now, here's the reason we did this whole thing. And I'm going to close with this. And Christiane, we'll get to where you need to go on time. Right? What do we need to do? What's our response to this? Our response to this can't be a postmodern deconstruction of value. Right? In other words, modernity and postmodernity in its wake, right, responded, and just to hear this, responded to the, to the pre-modern savageries by saying, let's destroy all religion. That, those love stories were so bad. Let's actually deny the universal love story and try and understand the universe right, based on self-evident truths. But self-evident truths don't cut it. Why are they self-evident? Right? So the desiccation of the field of value, which was modernity and postmodernity's response, to the excesses and brutalities of the traditional pre-modern world doesn't work. And a return to fundamentalism, right, is a degraded and disastrous form of love story. So what do we need to do? There's only one move that can be made. And it's gotta be made so passionately and so beautifully and so wondrously, right? Which is the movement of telling a new love story. That's the point, right? We actually have to tell a new love story, which is rooted in and evolution of love. And that love story has got to be filled with passion and filled with that felt sense of aliveness in the body. And that love story has got to be for every human being on the planet. I've got to love not only my son, not only my grandchild, your son and your grandchild and your granddaughter and your place and your people. And I've got to not just love Gil, but I have to care for and I have to pour into and I have to feel my relationship with every human being. And I have to feel my relationship of lived passion and love with every living being on the planet and then with the planet itself. Those are the fields of the evolution of love. That's the movement from Homo sapien to Homo amor. It's only the telling of a new love story in which there's a shared ground of value and value is eros, eros value, right? Eros, the movement towards separate parts that become larger unions. That's the plot line of the story. The plot line of the story is to actually realize that the whole thing's a love story. And that only if the whole, if the plot line of the entire thing is a love story, the only way to evolve beyond pathology, beyond breakdown, beyond crisis is the crossing. And what's the crossing? It's the crossing to the other side. It's the memory of the future. And what's the memory of the future? Homo amor. And homo amor is, it's a world religion of love, but not a world religion of ethnocentric love, not a world religion of you know, secular humanist love, which love is a social construction dissociated from the field of Eros value, those won't work, right? And it's when the fundamentalist looks at the postmodern desiccation of the field of value and the field of love, the post, right? The, 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 the fundamentalist feels like there's no place to turn, right? We are responsible, right, for not articulating. And Terry, this is the place you say we're all responsible. We're responsible for fundamentalism, because we haven't articulated a new love story that actually is worth its name. And to articulate a new love story is not just a declaration. We have to actually sit and articulate, right? A vision of a field of value and a moral theory in which no one's excluded. And we need to actually understand that reality is Eros and that Eros includes, right? Every living being on the planet. And actually it's all alive, it's a living universe. And it actually moves through me. And the plot line of the story is the evolution of love, right? 
And so ethnocentric love, which is pathological and abusive, doesn't work. And the first step is to reclaim the field of desire. It's actually be able to trust my own body, which is why a sexual ethos, a phenomenology of eros, because of the sexual models, the erotic is essential. And which is why a denying of the field of desire as it lives in the individual person is at the center, right, of most forms of fundamentalism and, 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 and clearly Shiite fundamentalism in which the young men of Hamas brutalize their own desire and brutalize the feminine, right? And sexual abuse, right? And honor killing and rape is of course the shadow expression of the dissociated field of desire. So actually, right? When we write about homo amor and about the new human and the new humanity in kind of philosophical terms, and we write about a new phenomenology of eros, a new story of desire, right? Those two vectors of our work, and we write about unique self and evolutionary unique self, right? What we're doing is, Right? We're actually telling a new vision of the universal love story that's never been articulated before because at this time between worlds and at this time between stories, right, the crisis needs to be responded to with a crossing, which is a crossing to right, a new right, and momentous leap forward in the evolution of love in which I become home more and more. I feel the goodness of my desire. I feel the field of eros and desire living alive, awake in me. And it includes everyone and no one's excluded. Right, that's that's where we're going. I love my son madly and insanely, but I will not ever, 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 right, suggest dharma based on the love of my son, or suggest policy based on the love of my son, which is ethnocentric, right, in its violating form. Right, I've got to love your son. You've got to love my son. Right. It's like wow. <laughs>